InfoPro Learning helps companies unlock the potential of their employees. Our goal is to deliver a sales training solution that will enable your sales team to sell better, faster, and retain customers for life. What is the competitive differentiator in any sale? The salesperson. We know the challenge you face every day, and it is getting more and more difficult as buyers buy more without even talking to a salesperson. So why would anyone need to talk to a salesperson? Here's why. Sometimes we all just need a valued partner to support us in a purchase. Salespeople must be that valued partner for their customers. A real seller prepares for a customer conversation with research, knows how to engage with the customer, serves as their advocate and knows how to lead to the solution. Sales methodology has evolved over the years with many approaches. We are now at a place where we need to build on the intelligence and strategy of past methodologies and get real. We want to give you a method that will be so powerful you will sell better, faster, and for the longer term with your customer. And we literally wrote the book on it. Carol Cohen, Vice President of Strategy and Sales Enablement, developed the real selling approach and wrote the book Real Selling, a simple solution to a complex problem. Take your first step to build your real sales team today. Contact InfoPro Learning. Hello, and welcome to today's training industry leader talk, Sales Training Essentials. Develop and empower your sales team. Sponsored by Adobe, Axiom Sales Kinetics, ELB Learning, InfoPro Learning, and Litmus. Before we dive into our next session, I would like to quickly go over a few housekeeping items to help you interact with our speakers and get the most out of today's sessions. Throughout today's event, please feel free to chat comments into the chat window and submit questions in the Q&A window. I'll be monitoring those comments and saving your questions, and we'll have a Q&A toward the end of the session. I have enabled closed captions for this event, and you can turn those on or off by locating the closed caption icon in your toolbar. We encourage you to share the information you receive today via social media. We'll be engaging in the conversation on X throughout the event, so please feel free to join in there. At the end of your time with us, we will give you a short survey that pops open on the in your browser at the end of the session. We'd appreciate your thoughts on today's event. Lastly, all of our sessions are being recorded and will be archived on trainingindustry.com. You will receive a follow-up email after today's session that includes a link to the on-demand sessions and to the slides. So if there's anything you missed, you can pick it up there. Okay, if this is your first training industry event, thank you for joining us. We exist to make connections among learning and development professionals, and we offer tons of resources to support your role in L&D through live events like today's Leader Talk, as well as through articles on our website, our magazine, conferences, research reports, and our podcast. Make Training Industry your go-to resource for learning solutions by visiting trainingindustry.com. Now, without any further ado, ado, I would like to introduce Carol Cohen. Her career spans from high school English teacher to corporate instructional designer. She has built award-winning programs for enterprise sales in large and small corporations. Three years ago, she joined the team at Impro Pro Learning, a full-service learning provider whose mission is to unlock human potential with workforce transformation. She is vice president of strategy and sales enablement there. And since joining InfoPro, her focus has been on success planning and learning strategies for today's learner. In addition, her passion to enable sales success has empowered her to develop a new sales approach and associated customizable training modules. She is the author of Real Selling, A Simple Solution to a Complex Problem, and has a new book out, Empower Sales Success with Effective Sales Training, that will be coming out this fall. At the end of her presentation, she'll be joined by Nolan Hout, who is Vice President of Marketing at InfoPro Learning for Q&A. So Carol, are you with us? I am. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep, we see you and hear okay. you. 
Okay, cool. So I'm gonna share my slides. You're okay with that? Cause I'm gonna move your eyes out of the way. Just boot it right up. Okay, let me find it. All right. So thank you and welcome to everyone who's joined us today. Sales training is my passion and I love talking about it and I hope you do too. So as Dee said, I'm uh, Carol Cohen and I'm currently the Vice President of Strategy and Sales Enablement at InfoPro. And literally my passion is sales enablement and sales training. Uh, the new book is available now. It came out faster than I thought, Empower Sales Success with Effective Sales Training. I wrote it for two reasons. First, because I went on Amazon and I searched for sales training books. And while I found literally a thousand sales books, I only found one on sales training. And it was somebody's workbook from a class they taught. And I thought, oh man, there's a gap. And the second reason is because I've worked long enough in sales training that my head had filled up to the point where it wanted to explode. And so I just let it explode into a book. So today I'm going to be talking about some of the topics that I put in the book, because I think they're very pertinent to sales training and the sales training challenge that many of us face on a daily basis. So I'm dividing the talk into three segments. One is about salespeople, mainly because there's a lot of mythology about them. And there are a lot of training decisions that are made based on this mythology. And I think that is the reason both salespeople and sales training get a bad rap. And I want to help alleviate some of that negativity around sales training. And the second topic I want to focus on is sales training itself. Determining the most effective approach means building on what the salespeople know already, using student-centered techniques and customizing to their point of need. And that's what makes it different from other training. And third, let's look at instructional design that component itself and the techniques that can make it most effective. It's gotta be learner centric. It's gotta be simple and elegant. So let's start with the salespeople. The salespeople today come to the classroom or the training environment with a whole panoply of exposure to methodologies of history of experience. And they've heard speakers talk about challenging. They've read books on insight selling and some other techniques. They've probably all taken a class in spin selling. And then they've likely had managers who told them one technique or another to be a good seller. So what they've actually done is they've woven together a patchwork quilt of methodologies that works for them. And if you ask them, they will pretty much tell you that they're fine. They'll say they don't need another methodology. The challenge for you in sales training is to be able to build on that and incorporate what is new with what is familiar. And therefore you need to be sure that you're fairly fluent in those primary methodologies. You can't say you've never heard or looked into Challenger and then go try to talk to a bunch of salespeople that have been had speakers on Challenger and are using some of those techniques. So you have to look at the methodologies that they've been exposed to, to know what you're building on. And sometimes you'll hear the opposite. Sometimes you'll hear them say, yeah, I heard about Challenger and I don't like it. It's old, you know, or something like that. And I don't care about it anymore. So you really have to know what you're building on with a particular team in order to get that training customized to where they exactly live right now. Salespeople come to training with that solid foundation. And your job is to build on that foundation. And you also need to align with their processes, especially in terms of where they need specific support. And this can this actually becomes their context. They likely have a standard sales process. It might be five steps at this company, seven steps at that company, six steps, whatever. But whatever those steps are, that's part of their context. And you have to ensure that that training 
is in the context of their process and then aligns to the buying process of the buyer, which is the other side of the coin. Now, the number two thing is to understand the salespeople, you have to also consider their buyer as well. The buyer does a lot of research before they even accept a conversation with a salesperson. And this should also be a factor in the context of the training. These days, post COVID, buyers will only go to a salesperson if they're looking for insight or partnership. This ups the game for salespeople to be knowledgeable, authentic, and truly a valued and long-term partner to their customers. And the training needs to support that. So salespeople, they have a reputation for being demanding, maybe a little difficult, maybe pushy, and that can easily convert into a negative impression of them as learners. But the reality is that they have a high pressure challenging job and their time is very important to them. So every minute that you spend focusing the training in their context works best. So recognize them as success driven. They wanna spend time only on what makes them successful. But at the same time, they're risk averse. And that means they won't take chances jeopardizing a deal just to try something new that you told them in a class, no matter what the incentive is. That absolutely means you have to use scenario-based training. They need to be able to practice in a safe place, such as a selfie assignment, I love that. I love it because, and this goes back to my old high school teaching days, I love it because they will do the selfie like 10 times before they like what they've done and they'll share it for evaluation. So it's really a great way to get them to practice without even asking them to. It's critical that they apply what they discover in training with at least enough confidence to try it once in the field. And that's why we have to look at the learner first with a clear understanding of the unique aspects of the salesperson's context. Now, the third thing that brings me to the common myths you might be aware of about salespeople. And the first and most famous and often spoken myth that people tell about salespeople is that they have no attention span. They even say it about themselves. And it cracks me up because I know it's not true. The truth is they have a wicked long attention span, but only for things they think support their success. So they'll give you exactly 15 to 20 seconds to prove that you're gonna support their success. And I mean that about training. I mean that about some of those sales platforms that, that can support their enablement. They're gonna take a customer call because they can get more success out of a customer call than sitting there listening to the instructor describe the learning objectives. And this is why in the first five minutes in a sales classroom, you will often hear the request to have the slides because they wanna take those slides and go outside and make some calls for their client instead. They'll look at the slides later maybe. They don't see any value in sitting in a classroom unless you can prove to them that the session will provide them with some success. So that's what you're up against. And if you buy into the mythology that they have a short attention span, you're not addressing the real issue. And the same is true when you're trying to encourage adoption of a sales enablement platform. They'll give it like 20 seconds tops and then they'll say, oh yeah, I looked at it and it didn't do a thing for me. And you've got this, if you understand the mythology and you understand what success looks like for them. And this will enable you to make better decisions in terms of which modality to use, how to structure classes, and what to curate and present in terms of enablement tools. It's a high stress situation. Now the fourth area of the salespeople to think about is the sales learner profile and just how hard their job is. And I mean, sales is based on building customer relationships so they trust enough to buy. That's complicated. And the salespeople have built a safety net between their network of methodologies that they're choosing to use 
and their understanding of and compassion for their customers. There's a blend there. And right in that vortex is where your training lives. And that's why you need to understand the context of your sales audience when you're preparing that course. Now, one of the things that salespeople are often called is competitive. And we in L&D usually interpret that to mean gamification or incentives like Starbucks gift cards. And that isn't really true. I mean, everybody loves gift cards and free stuff and everybody loves getting an extra bonus. But the reality is they're success driven. So when they go into a classroom, they expect that what you're giving them is something to make them successful. And you're not just gonna fill up their heads with more knowledge or share some interesting story about how you did it or how some sales guy did it. You must really give them something that will support their success. And that's what drives them. And that's what will keep them coming back for more. So let's look at the sales training itself and why it's so different. Or I should rephrase this another way. Why do people hate sales training? <laughs> they hate doing sales training. I have to say, I have made an entire career out of the fact that most people cannot stand to do sales training. They think it's a moving target. They think the sales audience is difficult to work with. They just find the whole thing too challenging and too weird, and they just don't want anything to do with it. So those of us who take the challenge and hear the call and really want to do sales training, we really want to enable the sales success. And we have to look at sales training as requiring a different approach from other types of training that we do. Now, the first thing I would focus on is what I call the sales success plan. And this is just my new thing. It's like a kick that I'm on. You know, many years of looking at the Kirkpatrick model and trying to focus on level three behavior change and level four business results, I couldn't see it until recently, a couple of years ago. I wanted to figure out how to measure success and how to empower salespeople to contribute to the business goals and measure their behavior change. And then I had an epiphany and it was a combination of two things. One, it was about InfoPro and their unlock the potential of people. But the other was something that my manager from a thousand years ago, Ray Kerwin told me in terms of sales that if you can't solve the small problem, solve the big problem. And, you know, for, I don't know, a decade, I couldn't figure out what he meant. But as I went through thinking about that and it all came together, I realized that that's, that was our mistake with level three and four. We didn't go up to the bigger problem. The bigger problem is why to have training at all for this, this audience. And when we look at it that way, we say, okay, what are the things that they want the business wants them to do. What is the change in behavior that they're looking for overall? And how can what we do in training contribute to that? So when I had that epiphany, I began asking the sales leadership, what do you want them to do, to say, to know, to show, to find differently than they do now? And that conversation changed everything. You can see how the training is not just a bunch of knowledge, it's how they put that knowledge into action. Now, the second piece of the puzzle is how do you do that? And that means training that is embedded with activities and discussion. And I'm convinced at this point, post COVID, that virtual instructor led training is the best thing for salespeople. Why? One, because it's probably two hours long. And it's about all the time that they can manage to take away from their day job. Uh, and two, because it gives them a chance to talk to each other, share their stories, learn from each other, interact with their key topics, allows them to practice, and it helps them gain confidence in the change required. And I said earlier, the purpose here is so they can apply what they learn on the, on the job and believe in it. So how do you do that? You have to customize the content to provide that context. And this is the part that makes sales training so different because on a daily basis, the sales guy has got to know the marketing messaging. He's got to know the product information. He's got to know what his customer is doing in his business. He's got to know what the market trends are for the customer. 
And he's got to put that all together in a, his value story that he's going to tell the customer. And that's what you have to do in training too. That means that the training is not derived from a single source. If you find it only comes from one source, then I can tell you it's product training, not sales training. You must find sources from both inside and outside the company to put these pieces together and connect those dots for the salespeople. Now, I'll just add one little thought about this. A lot of times when it comes to sales training, you hear this term soft skills versus hard skills. Well, the hard skills are the product knowledge information, right? Or maybe the messaging, if you want to get broad about it. And the soft skills are like building trust, negotiation, stuff like that. But the sales training has to be a union of those two together. There can't be hard skills over here, soft skills over here. It has to be selling combines those two to make that training happen. And that's what makes it so challenging. I already mentioned earlier, activities and discussion are crucial, but practical application is also extremely important. And they have to practice in order to build confidence and allay their sense of risk. Remember, success-driven, risk-averse. That way they can try it with their customer immediately. Now, my point here is adult learning the associated learning approaches and designing training is in fact our superpower. So when we in the training world go into a conversation with a bunch of sales leaders and represent how to train and teach salespeople, that becomes our superpower at the table. And sometimes we get a little bit nervous or we start to think like, oh yeah, we're down here in training. And the subject matter experts are up there and in smarty pants land. But you have to recognize that you're working with a different group of stakeholders than you normally work with in L&D. You're working with business leaders, often the sales enablement leader, who's actually a former salesperson. They don't come from the L&D world. So you have to represent how things get learned. And that's a pretty interesting position to be in. And it's actually a superpower. So let's look at instructional design for all this and just get down and dirty with it and get our favorite Aunt Addie and Uncle Sam and talk about how sales training is different. Now, I already told you that it's different because the sales audience is different. And it's different because of the nature of the training itself in terms of the content and where you get it is different. But when we look at the approach, we also see a difference. Compare it to the common design of corporate training, which so often, and just it creeps me out to even say it, is tell them, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them and tell them again. And we need to take a different approach with salespeople. We need to take that learner-centric, student-centered learning approach. And that means we move from the guide on the, the sage on the stage to the guide on the side. Now, you know that sage on the stage. You've seen him a million times. He's the guy that comes in. He's got all this experience. He's got a massive amount of product knowledge. And he tells these really great stories. And basically, he's just lecturing. And when he's done, he pretty much looks over his shoulder and says, hey, you know, hope you enjoyed this. Just be me, and you'll be great. And if you have any questions, just call me. Well, that's a great event. And sometimes it's fantastic at the annual sales meeting on the main stage. And it can be exciting and the salespeople get very jazzed about it. Maybe they pick up a couple things. But they'll remember it as an exciting event or maybe even an inspiring event. But that's all it is because when it comes to training, they really have to wrestle with ideas in order to change. And they must have the opportunity for practice within the context of the training, which means you have to provide that guide on the side, helping them discover on their own as they internalize what is new. And they learn through discussions, challenging questions, even scenario-based activities. Now I'm using those terms instead of the term you expected me to say, which is role plays. Because often when we think of role plays, we think of writing role plays, 
that they have to perform like actors. And what I actually mean by that is asking them what typical customer interactions have they had that very week that they went, they wished meant, went differently. And once they share a couple of examples, the instructor can select one and then they role play it a couple of different ways. Since that scenario just happened that very week, it's the same time of thing that's going to happen to them next week. And that means that in your training, the learners are actually wrestling with something that's very real to them. And that means the guide on the side instructor is able to guide and reinforce some of the aspects of the training in the context of those scenarios. And this is how you get them to recognize that success potential and apply it as soon as they leave the class. And that's what's so important. Now, the second area to look at is context and content. And I'm going to say it again because they're so similar. Context and content. And this is where it really gets challenging. Because for the most part, you're not talking to people in the sales department who have a familiarity with learning. They're not fluent in learning ease, which most of our marketing and product stakeholders are. Those stakeholders know how to talk to the L&D people. And they know the kind of thing that L&D offers. Usually your leader of sales enablement is a former sales manager or sales seller, not really fluent in the sort of learning speak that we use on a daily basis. So you have to take the lead with them and really talk to them about how you're going to empower those salespeople to success and how you're going to design the training because you understand the learner, you understand salespeople, and you understand instructional design. And in parentheses, they don't. So they may understand a lot of other things that you don't understand, but this goes back to your superpower and you can make commitments to their success outcomes and you can make their team successful. Now, the third area is the approach. And I always use the term simple and elegant. I don't know, maybe I'm weird about it, but I use that term a lot these days. Mark Twain said it best, I quote him all the time. If I had more time, it'd be shorter. It takes a lot of time to take something that's long and bulky, like, I don't know, five-day boot camp, ever hear of that? And distill it down into a fine wine. Distill it down into that simple and elegant exercise or activity-based training that will make a difference for those salespeople. Chunked into modules that will support them in real life. So we need to look at their whole context, their whole reality, and then build on what they already know and do. And this will support the change that the business wants them to do, say, show differently than they do now. And that's our trick. Now, the reality is, as instructional designers and content creators for training, we can do this in our sleep. But we have to recognize that it's a priority for this particular audience. And it's really important to think about all of this because your sales learner will not stand for a long wordy lecture that they already know. They will take a client call right in the middle of your class. And then you will determine that salespeople have no attention span, but the truth is we have to own that challenge. And as instructional designers of sales training, we have to say, I am going to make this so targeted for their needs that they're going to recognize its value and they're going to practice it. And when they leave here, they're going to try something new. And I'm going to be able to line that up to metrics that I identified at the very beginning. And I'm going to be able to see that change in those guys. Simple and elegant, see? Now, the last piece of the special challenge of sales training is about tests and assessments. This is where I really get going. I can't say it enough. Learning checks, tests, and assessments all need to be scenario-based. And the reason for that is because it's not product knowledge. It's not product training. It must be based on the situation with a customer with a focus on the appropriate response. And here's a situation demonstrating why it's an example of empathy or trust building or why it's not. Now, there are rules about question writing, but I have one hard and fast rule. 
No lazy bones questions. That means never write not questions where all the answers are correct except one. And the other lazy no-no is all of the above questions. You can't have a superpower for training and then sell out by writing lousy, ridiculous awareness level questions at the end of a very sophisticated sales training. The questions need to be about scenarios that relate to their context. And I would even venture to say that every answer should be somewhat correct because that's what life is like. And you need to get the heart of what those salespeople face every day and how they take that challenge. And that makes it hard. Not only do you have to have those great scenarios and those decent questions, but you also have to have brilliant feedback that says, okay, that answer was partly right because of this some reason and partly wrong because of that reason. And I never said this was easy because it isn't, but it's true. But that's where it gets tough in terms of development. But you know, we have our new best friend, ChatGPT. And it's almost like having an intern who can write a different draft of something for you. You ask it to come up with a selling scenario in a certain industry that demonstrates empathy, say in a retail environment, within 10 seconds, it'll do it. And that's just the beginning of what you can use it for in your training. You can also ask it for a Bloom's level three question about that scenario, and it'll give you the first draft of a pretty excellent question. Now, I keep saying first draft because I believe at this point with this technology, that's what we are getting. We're asking ChatGPT or AI to be our intern, to come up with a little first draft of what we need to develop. And sure, it'd be tempting to just go, hey, write the whole thing for me. But the reality is not for your sales learner. You bring that special something to the table, remember your superpower? And you have to customize that training to their situation and make sure it really fits. And that isn't what you're getting out of ChatGPT. So I'm not opposed to using it for your first draft if it gets you away from writing not questions or all of the above questions or where the longest answer is always correct. And I'll give you an example from real life. So I'm currently obsessed with a silly rom-com called um, Puppy Love. And I was reading some reviews of it. I was reading two reviews that were on a similar topic about it. And there was one that was very heartfelt and it was written about all the different aspects of what happens in the movie and why it's entertaining and stuff like that. And it was very enjoyable to listen to. And then I listened to the second one. And in the second one, it was clear it was written by AI. Um, it, the robot voice did not pronounce the name Nicole correctly. The robot voice had all, also made some connections that you would only make if you weren't watching the movie, but you were scanning it for keywords or concepts. And it actually made some mistakes. So while the first one may have been based on an AI version, it was customized in a way that it appealed to me as a, as a reader and as a, as a viewer of that movie. And the second one was obviously just thrown up there straight from AI and it was terrible. And so that's my caution about this. You can make something brilliant out of your first draft from AI, and you can up your game in terms of assessments and scenarios, but you have to take the responsibility for that customization. So I'm gonna end here. I'm gonna stop here because I'm hoping there are some questions and we can have a conversation. Now, I have a dream. Well, I have a two-part dream. Uh, one is that I'm going to be able to go into a restaurant with a friend and my friend's going to order a Diet Pepsi and I'm going to order a Diet Coke and we're going to sit together and enjoy our sodas. That's my first dream. And I always share that whenever I can in case it might change the world. And my second dream is that one day on these platforms, the audience can talk out loud with the speaker. But those days are yet to come. So if you've typed a question or a comment and you want us to... Uh, uh, talk about it and answer it and have a discussion. I've got people on the panel with me will help with that. Um, please put your questions or comments in there and have a conversation. I am so passionate about sales training and sales enablement. I will literally talk to anybody anytime about it. And so you can find me on LinkedIn and send me a message or email. And if you want to, if you want to talk to me about it. Now, if you want to talk to me and sell me something I already do, 
Uh, you probably should hold yourself back. But if you just want to talk to me about sales training, I would be thrilled to do that. So thank you. So I'm going to throw it over to Nolan, who is now our chief sales officer. Mm, and he's going to talk to us. He's going to tell me what's been going on in the chat. And I uh, am looking forward to that conversation. Let me try to not share my screen if I can figure out how to do that. Oh, that's okay. Even if you can't, Carol, I'm going to, we, we got a couple, you know, we, we got one very nice question saying that you were the best presenter of training industry and I'm going to buy your book. So that oh, <laughs> thank okay. you, thank yeah. you. I'll talk to you any day, anytime. So, 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 um, but a couple really good. I mean, all, all the questions are really good, um, but I'll just take them from the top, um, uh, because because I think they're they're all equal. One is from Angela. What kind of test or assessment do you think is best for sales professionals? Well, it's a combination, you know, I think, well, I think the number one test is the selfie test. When you, and you, that means do your homework, have a rubric, take, put on your superpower cape, have a rubric of what you expect them to do. Tell them to make you a, a video of themselves, a selfie of themselves, and really evaluate it and give them some solid feedback. Now you might be thinking to yourself, yeah, but I've got 25,000, blah, blah. I'm like, no, you do it one person at a time. Because the reality is with salespeople, they talk to each other. And if you can get a couple of them going, they'll influence the others and the title, title go. So that's the first best way. And the second is to just use scenarios. It, because otherwise you default to product training. And that that isn't what this is. It has its place, but just knowing what your product is, isn't, isn't what they need. They need to know how to put that product knowledge in context of their, of their buyer. And, uh, you know, that's a complicated thing. So it requires a scenario. That's what I, that's, that's what I think. And then not the longest answers correct all the time and no, not, or all of the above questions. <laughs> I can't say what about, that enough. <laughs> what about if your answers to these questions go long? <laughs> Uh, hey, I could talk all day. I could talk all day. And I think I've really done well this time because usually I go for like 45 minutes. So I left some time for some questions. Uh, you did. That was, yeah. Um, another Do really good try one. Try it, Nolan. <laughs> I, Isaac, Isaac asked a question that I've heard you talk to quite a bit. What is your favorite sales methodology aside from real selling, which is the best sales methodology which is ever the best thing created by on Carol? Earth. I would answer that in two ways. I think understanding challenger is really important. I think there's a lot of things that challenger did in terms of the buying cycle and how you map that buying cycle and how you lead to the solution rather than with the solution to make everyone more consultative. So even if you don't call yourself a challenger seller, the concepts in challenger are really important. The other one is a book by, um, by my friend Mahan Khalsa, who is with Stephen Covey, uh, called Let's Get Real or Let's Not Play. And he also has some fantastic key concepts. And he's got all kinds of three-minute videos on YouTube, Mahan Khalsa. So if you look at those two, I think that's where we are at this point. I think all the others build to where we are, but those are the two big key um, key areas. And then everything else is just, you know, practical common sense. Love your customer, meet them where they are, sell them stuff, and they'll give you all their money. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's it. So uh, next one's from our friend Cynthia. What do you feel are the important knowledge and skills needed for the L&D staff who build sales training? <laughs> well, first of all, agility and agility and confidence. I, I find that so many L&D people lack the confidence to have the success conversation with the business leaders to just go in and say, look, I want to know what your business goals are. And I can do that because I'm an instructional designer. You know, that's that confidence piece. 
The other is the agility to be able to say, I am going to look really everywhere for the content that I need for this. Now really capitalize on what you know about your learner, what you know about your methodologies and be creative enough to say this, this sales team needs this right now. And I, to me, it's, it's around confidence. It's, mm -hmm. it, I think all the skills are there. Um, I mean, once you get past, tell them what you're going to tell them and tell them again. But, you know, really understanding student-centered education, student-centered learning, that, that, would be, that would be the course to take. <laughs> I'm trying then, not to talk so long, Nolan. I'm yeah, so there's a, a, a really good one here from Melody. How do you encourage sales leaders to get on board with a program and get them to actually help with the execution of that? And, and like the long term, right? Because you have the right. short term, can I get the 30 minutes on your sales meeting to talk about it? But then there's the long term, how do we keep this not flavor of the month? Right. And, and that, that is the biggest trick. And that goes back to the, do, are we talking to the traditional L and D stakeholders? Or are we talking to these salespeople? Because I'll give you a perfect example. So just, you know, you're going to see there's an infographic and it's got this whole mythology about the memory, you know, remembering curve or whatever it is, which we in L and D know is a myth actually. And, and so the idea that, you know, sales training, you know, they only remember 10% of it. Well, that type of thing, if you say that to your traditional stakeholder, they'll, they'll go, well, how can we make the training better to have them remember more? If you say that to a sales leader, and I would even suffice it to say, if I said it to you, Nolan, you would say to me, then why am I going to invest in training? If nobody remembers it, why should I do that? <laughs> so yeah. you have to change your story, just like a salesperson does, understand where your customer is coming from. And what you have to convince them is training is part of their success plan. It is part of their picture. There are new things they have to learn. There are enablement tools they have to build. And you have to build that same kind of reputation with them that their salespeople have to build with their customers. So you have to look at this as a new type of stakeholder who has a different understanding of learning. Salespeople do not want learning. Salespeople, sales leaders do not want to take their people out of the field for training. So you have to get through that first. And once you do that, once you build that reputation with them, they'll always come back to you. That's total, what I total. Say. T totally agree. This is a really interesting question, Carol, because I, I know that you and I were just uh, going to talk with the client about it. Um, and it's about like the, the, the difference, I think, between kind of like sales training and sales leadership training and says, how would you approach a training on leadership for a sales leadership team while still focusing on the sales aspect? Well, I kind of try to avoid the leader <laughs> training <laughs> just out of my own personal preference. But I do think managers and sales leaders need help uh, appropriately coaching, guide on the side, their people. Because a lot of them come from a world of just do it. You've got to get it mm -hmm. done by the 30th. We have to close this quarter. Just do it. Just close it. You know, that's their idea of coaching. So when when uh, what we do at InfoPro with our modules is every one of them has at least a one pager for the manager that says this is what they learned in this module. A couple of points, not too much reading. Here's some questions you can ask your team at a team meeting for discussion. And here's some tips you could give somebody on a one-on-one -on -one associated with that. And I think we have to take responsibility for that kind of safety net for their managers. So mm. uh, that's the way I would look at it. Now, as far as teaching in a leadership way and leadership training, you have to get into the, a lot of the you know active listening and all that kind of jazz with them and kind of change their behavior from just do it to being a real coach for their teams and sharing the responsibility of the met of the goals. That's the other piece of it too. So I could talk all day. Yeah. You know that Carol, you, I saw you, you, yeah, you have 
this is the first time ever everybody is in for a treat. This is the first time Carol has ended a minute early. Um, and D hasn't forced us out of the training industry is kicking us off stage every excellent. <laughs> excellent. I'm so psyched. And I'm not kidding. If you want to have a conversation, you know, with me, I'd be happy to talk about any of this with you if you just send me a message in uh LinkedIn and Absolutely. we can set something up. Yeah, yeah. Like do it. do send Carol a note. We'll follow up as well. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining. And Thanks please so continue much. to give your business to trainingindustry.com. They are a tremendous partner of ours and a thought leader. Um, please do um, continue on and, and, and use them as a great resource for you for anything you need. Yeah. So I'm sorry. I do wish we had more time. It's always nice to have dynamic speakers like you, Carol and Nolan. So I hope you'll join us again soon. Absolutely. Okay, um, so we are going to take another 15 minute break, give everybody a chance to think about what you've heard and come back for more. Uh, up next, we will have Dr. Alan Partridge, who is joining us from Adobe for the session, Navigating the Hybrid Landscape, Transforming B2B Sales Skilling for the New Reality. And he has a lot of interesting information to share with us. So I will end this session in just a moment. Please go over to the next session from the lobby and we will see you at the top of the hour. Thank you. Thank you.